Chapter 11, Stars. Certainly a very important chapter and uh, lots of beautiful pictures that we'll be looking at. Let's start with where stars begin. Inside nebulae, clouds of dust and gas sitting in the cold vacuum of space. They actually can cause starlight passing through them uh, to be more red in color. Uh, we call this interstellar reddening. And we see this in our own lives. When you see the sunset and it's very orangish in color, that's because you're looking through a filter of atmosphere. And our atmosphere allows the longer wavelength red to pass through more easily than the shorter wavelength blue. Or the moon, when it's rising, can appear very yellow. But if you look at that same moon a couple hours later, it'll be white again when it's above that filter of atmosphere. We'll show a, I'll end the lecture with a great example of this in a bit. First up, uh, long ago, they called pretty much everything in the sky that wasn't a star a nebula. Of course, they were looking at things like uh, star clusters and galaxies and didn't realize it. Uh, today, we break up nebulae into several different types. Uh, the most important type, I believe, uh, would be emission nebulae, also called H2 regions, star-forming regions, where brand new stars are being born, stellar nurseries, if you will. And one of the interesting things that we see in these stellar nurseries are some of these stars have sort of donuts of material around them called proplids. Proplid stands for protoplanetary disks, and these are new solar systems that are forming. Though They're going to clump together due to gravity and form planets. So we're seeing the birth of solar systems. It's very exciting, very interesting to see. The two star-forming regions uh, that I would want you to know. The Orion Nebula, for sure. It is one of the premier backyard telescope-type objects to see. And the Eagle Nebula, which is part of one of the most famous and iconic pictures in astronomy due to the Hubble telescope. Let's start, however, with Orion. And if you look, you find the famous belt of Orion. Underneath the belt, you have Orion's sword. And right in the middle of the sword, right about there, is a very uh, kind of a pinkish, cloudish looking uh, region there. That is the Orion Nebula. And as we zoom in here, uh, this is a picture that I myself took uh, when I was first learning astrophotography a couple years ago of the Orion Nebula. Uh, here's one from my student last year. Uh, and his is even better than mine, which makes me really proud of him. What a great picture there of the Orion Nebula. But anyway, one of the things to look for in a backyard telescope are four stars that are particularly close together. They form a little trapezoid there, if you look at the bottom left of the screen, uh, called the trapezium. So that's something to look for uh, with a telescope. And there are the proplids that I mentioned, okay? These donut-shaped areas, these regions will eventually form planets, astronomers believe. So that is pretty neat. Um, here's a name you may come across when you read about star formation. Uh, some newborn stars are called Titari stars. They're uh, kind of sputtering into existence, and um, they're not quite yet stable, and they have that name Titari. Here is the other one that I want you to know by sight, by name. The part of the Eagle Nebula called the Pillars of Creation, a very famous picture made famous by the Hubble Telescope in the 1990s might get my vote for the picture of the decade for the 1990s. It's that iconic. I have a poster of it in my room. Each of these pillars, you must understand, is there are several light years in height there. So you're not talking about one new star system forming. You're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of star systems forming, stars being born inside these. I think that one's seven light years tall. Um, unbelievable. Now, that's just part of the Eagle Nebula. Here's another part, part called the Fairy. And together, wow, how beautiful is that? So you see the uh, pillars there towards the top and the Fairy over here. All of that is the Eagle Nebula. Um, that particular coloring is kind of special. It's called the Hubble Palette. Um, the Hubble team uses a different coloring technique. They assign colors based on elements. So sodium might be red and oxygen might be green and so forth. And they get this uh, particular coloring. You can tell when it's a Hubble picture uh, by that Hubble palette. Really beautiful. Versus this, same patch of sky with a very different uh, coloring there, a different palette that they're using. Here's one called Thor's Helmet. 
and we could go on and on. These are just beautiful because the stars light them up. Flaming Star Nebula makes them really great, of course, for um, photography. Here's one that is usually the APOD, the Astronomy Picture of the Day, on Valentine's Day, the uh, Rosette Nebula, for obvious reasons. And here's one where the stars are really starting to push away the dust and gas and starting to become a true cluster at this point. So that one's kind of a halfway point there between being a nebula and being a cluster. So I really like that one. And here's one more here, a... Uh, Another uh, well-known backyard astronomer type object to try to photograph and see, the Trifid Nebula. Okay, other types of nebulae, dark cloud and reflection nebulae. They're essentially the same thing. They're kind of sitting there in space, not really doing much. They're not forming stars. They're very cold. And the only difference between the two is that a reflection nebula has one or more stars nearby that are illuminating it. And I'll show you some pictures to illustrate that. So they're pretty much the same thing. And just like clouds in the sky, um, they can sometimes form pictures uh, that are of interest. So the most famous one probably is the Horsehead Nebula. And I'll also show you the North American Nebula. Again, they're not of, uh, I think, great importance because they're not forming stars or anything, uh, but they can make some interesting, interesting pictures. We'll look first here, I believe, at the North American Nebula. So you see maybe that's supposed to be Florida and the Gulf of Mexico and Mexico down here in America. So that's um, the North American Nebula, for example. And then we have the famous horse head. Now here's a view of the horse head you normally don't see. I wanted to show this first to show you that the horse head is part of a vast complex of dust and gas. Um, there's the little horse head right there. That's all it is. And as we zoom in, you start to see it, uh, that's the flame nebula over here. You start to see it the way it is typically in posters. This is kind of the typical poster picture of the horse head is how you see it. But it's actually a pretty small feature compared to the area uh, around it. It also looks a lot more like a seahorse to me than a, than a horse. Okay, here's a reflection nebula. This is the witch head, which I showed on Halloween, I believe. And uh, the witch head has that bright star there in the middle of the screen. That's actually the star Rigel, and uh, it's lighting it up. Rigel's not part of the witch. Now, the witch, there's her nose and her mouth and her chin, and um, Rigel's not part. It wasn't born from the witch head nebula or anything. It just happens to be lined up in a way to illuminate it for us, so that's why we call it a reflection uh, nebula. And you can see where it's at in relation there to Rigel and to some of the other things here, the other nebula we talked about. Very nice patch of sky right there, I would say. Very busy patch of sky. And here's the Tarantula Nebula. And uh, I believe this one's the Witch's Broom. Uh, whatever it is, it's definitely a reflection nebula. You have a bright star there illuminating it. And we have some little ghouls there, another one I show on Halloween usually. Nice picture there. Still a lot of dust and gas uh, left there. And then I'll uh, end with this one, Barnard 68, which is one of the darkest nebulae that I've seen. It's pretty rare that you simply can't see through a nebula. The Colsac Nebula in the Southern Hemisphere would be another good example of that. And what I wanted to show, not only how dense it is, but I also wanted to show, if you look at the stars on the edge, they start appearing more yellowish, and then orangish, and then as you get deeper in there, they, they appear red. So it's a great example of interstellar reddening, showing the stars as the starlight passes through, how it becomes more red in color. And so uh, that's it for today for Nebulae. Thank you very much for listening.